Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Yesterday, the State Council issued more detailed plans in response to the panicked meetings of last week, as one analyst described them. It increasingly looks like all bets are off to support the Chinese economy, no matter the cost, short term or long. The only constraint is the zero COVID policy. Of course, we remember last week that the State Council, China's cabinet, unveiled a 33-point plan covering fiscal and monetary policies, investment, consumption, food security, energy, logistics, supply chains, and more, with the goal of quote stabilizing the economy in the second quarter. End quote. Yesterday, Tuesday, central government departments published more detailed policies based on these 33 points, and they will be rolled out this month. One of these policies, for example, is that the government will grant up to 1,500 RMB in subsidies per hire of recent university graduates for companies, showing once again how concerned Beijing is about the large numbers of graduates unable to find jobs in the current environment. Of course, this will not increase employment. All other things being equal, it will merely incentivize employers to hire from that particular group rather than from other groups. Or fire older, more expensive workers in exchange for cheaper, subsidized workers. Nevertheless, the coming stimulus will be massive, and it needs to be. The economy is in a very poor shape at the moment. With that point, we have more bad news on the economic front to go through, just to get an idea of the work ahead of the government. Now, let's start with the housing market, a huge driver of the Chinese economy. We have some new data for the month of May. And surprise, surprise, it's not good. According to preliminary data from the China Real Estate、uh, Information Corp, China's 100 biggest real estate companies saw new home sales collapse 59 percent in May year on year, a similar rate to what we saw in April. Even though many measures were rolled out last month to stop the bleeding in the housing sector, including urging banks to lend more, lowering mortgage costs, and easing rules on owning multiple properties. The industry-wide crisis continues to shock investors as well, with even state-backed developers having difficulty with their debt. For example, last week the market saw a large-scale sell-off among higher-rated companies after state-backed Green Land Holdings Corp. sought to delay repayment on a dollar bond. Most analysts predict that sales will remain weak and not begin to narrow until Q3 or Q4. And then only after significant government support, and if the wider economy can be stabilized in the coming months, any government support as well will likely reverse much of the modest gains regulators have achieved in trying to deleverage the industry over the last year or so. Now, one thing we need to keep our eyes on with all of this is, of course, the banking system. We already covered the cash crisis with some rural banks in yesterday's video. More pressure on the housing market risks systemic risks spreading in the broader financial system. Though some experts are not too worried about this, and we will touch on this shortly. Meanwhile, another theme we have been following closely in recent months with the Chinese economy is the possible mass exodus of foreign talent and investment China may see this year. On Tuesday, yesterday, the British Chamber of Commerce in China published its latest position paper, expressing that foreign business sentiment in China has reached a tipping point. Quote, Recent sporadic outbreaks of COVID-19 across the country and the corresponding snap lockdowns have taken away one of the things most businesses have been able to depend on. A stable and relatively predictable business environment, a growing sense of detachment and isolation among the foreign business community in China is now tangible. The lack of clarity and communication in regards to various policies, goals, and processes is perhaps the most significant cause for concern. End quote. The report goes on to discuss some of the same issues identified in other business lobby group publications from the European Union, the United States, and Japan. For example, due to China's strict border controls, businesses are seeing a quote sizable outflow of international talent. End quote, including an estimated 40 to 60 percent、uh, departure rate of international teachers for the coming school year, which cannot be replaced. And one more thing, while we're on the economy, Bloomberg's Hong Kong team published a piece yesterday discussing how Chinese banks are flush with credit, but there is little demand for it. After loan growth weakened in April to the worst levels in almost five years, several indicators suggest the data for May won't be much better. 
One senior China strategist at ANZ, Australia New Zealand, Banking Group Limited, quoted in the article Express, quote, The sluggish credit demand points to worsening expectations among market entities and slowing business expansion. End quote. Now, let us end this part on the Chinese economy with an observation made by Peking University Professor of Finance, Michael Pettis. Quote, I agree that an economic collapse would be terrible for China and the world, but I think it is very unlikely. China's largely closed and tightly controlled financial system makes balance sheet breakdowns very remote. Far likelier is a decade or two of much slower growth as the economy grinds away and reverses trillions of dollars of overvalued real estate and infrastructure spending. The Chinese adjustment, in other words, is more likely to resemble Japan post-1990 than Brazil post-1982. End quote. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep the channel sustainable, Patreon, Buy Me Coffee, and crypto links are in the description below. As always, thank you everybody for the ongoing support. Next up, on Saturday, we had a full video on PRC moves in the South Pacific. If you haven't seen it and you're interested in this particular area, hit up that video and you'll also have some more context for the developments we're going to cover now. At the second China-Pacific Island Countries Foreign Ministers meeting held on Monday, virtually, People's Republic of China Foreign Minister Wang Yi and leaders from eight Pacific Island nations agreed to cooperate in five areas, including health, disease management, and agriculture, as well as others. However, the Pacific Island nations did not sign on to the more ambitious trade and security initiatives that had been suggested by Beijing. In response, Wang Yi said that more discussion was needed on the so-called China-Pacific Island country's common development vision. Though these are mixed results for the People's Republic of China, China's efforts in the strategically increasingly important region region of the South Pacific will only continue, posing a competitive challenge for the United States and its regional allies like Australia. Now before we move on, one more quick matter related to Asia-Pacific diplomacy. According to Japanese media, Japan's foreign ministry has launched a new China strategy group. Nikkei Asia reports that the new team will collect and analyze political, economic, and diplomatic intelligence related to China in order to, quote, inform Tokyo's strategy towards Beijing. End quote. And last up, let's end this episode with some positive news. Today, June 1st, after two months of devastating lockdown, the residents of Shanghai take the first substantial steps towards reopening their city. Buses, the entire rail transit network, and ferry services resumed operations today. Private cars and corporate vehicles can travel most places except medium and high-risk COVID areas and similar so-called closed-off management zones. Shanghai's airports fully reopened today, and the proportion of seats permitted to be filled in flights has been raised to 60% from the previous 40%. Shopping malls, supermarkets, and convenience stores can resume on-site business from today, with the total visitor capacity capped at 75%, though movie theaters, gyms, and other businesses remain closed. Most of Shanghai's 25 million residents can now freely leave their home. Residents who enter public places must hold a negative nucleic acid test report within 72 hours. People living in medium to high risk areas or closed off management zones, however, must remain inside. Shanghai will resume offline classes in phases with high school students in the top two grades and students in the third year of junior high school receiving priority, according to the authorities. Now, we need to remember that while this is all good news for the people of Shanghai, China is still where it was a few months ago, with low vaccination rates, a high risk of Omicron breakouts, and no national opening up plans. Indeed, Beijing has yet to provide an exit strategy for the current situation the country is facing. And until it does, the risk of more lockdowns and the economic and human cost that comes with it remains. Meanwhile, the question of who will pay for the COVID testing, which is being rolled out all across the country, a theme which we have been discussing for several weeks now, is becoming a popular concern online. The Ministry of Finance this week has urged local governments to set aside enough money for COVID-related expenses in the wake of a national ruling that requires localities to pay for mass testing out of their own pockets. Of course, ultimately, it doesn't matter too much who actually pays because this massive cost will be placed on the entire economy, and thus the society as a whole. Okay, that's today's episode of China Update. We'll have another episode tomorrow. See you then.